All right, um, a little bit past time. Go get go ahead and get started here. Uh, although uh, not too many people here yet. Um, let's see here. So let me close these all off. Um, all right. Um, so as a reminder, we are coming up to the second assignment here. Uh, um, hmm, I got to check my calendar here. Um, all right. I meant I meant for the assignment two to be due on Friday. Uh, hmm. Uh, might be showing up wrong. I'll, I'll check the due date on that. So yeah, for you guys who are here, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the second assignment in here by by Friday. Um, I was planning on talking more about the second assignment. See if people have questions on it more specifically here to, um, today and Thursday. Um, I mean, as a reminder, the second assignment, uh, make certain you're getting the version that's out there right now. So um, there is a uh, updated version. Uh, so don't do the wrong, don't do the, the old one. Um, or, you know, uh, you won't get any credit for it. So uh, likewise for assignment three, um, there's probably gonna be some uh, updates on that too. So uh, don't don't start on assignment three yet. Just be working on assignment two uh, at this point. So. Um, so um, looking at content, um, this is really an important, uh, portion of the course, uh, at least um, if you want to get into, uh, you know, understanding some of the things at, at a deeper level. Um, so we're actually going to be covering uh, the the chapter on linear regression for this week and next week and maybe the week after that as well, um, which is what, chapter three? No, it's not. Um, um, yeah, chapter three on linear regression. If I, if I have that right. So, so really we're covering like uh, the first part of, of chapter three this week. Um, um, and uh, yeah, next week we're going to be looking at um, um, polynomial regression. Assignment three is really kind of heavily on polynomial regression uh, and also regularization. Right? So some, some big kind of fundamental ideas in terms of how the machine learning algorithms can, are going to be happening here this next two weeks. Okay, so um, so um, yeah. Sorry, chapter four. That's what I thought. Chapter four um, is the linear regression chapter. So um, I, I want to get started on those, then we'll jump back, uh, maybe and look at, at the assignment again, see if people have questions on uh, specifically on that. So I'll try and save 10 minutes or so to jump to that. Um, but uh, this will help you with this current assignment if you get through the, uh, the, the basic discussion on linear regression here. Um, So let's, uh, let me make certain this is all still running here. All right, good. Um, so we started on some of the stuff last week. Um, so let's... Uh, um, review a few of the things that, that we started talking about. Um, so our, our kind of our goal on this first part here is to understand the basics of how the linear regression works. Okay. So it's, it's a good, if you understand uh, how a linear regression model is fit to some data, it's a good general, you know, the, the same concept works for lots of other machine learning algorithms. All right. So, um, um, so we're, we're talking about regression. Um, um, so re recall that there's two basic splits of, of models, either a regression problem or a classification problem. So in this case, we're trying to make a model to predict a set of data uh, where the, the thing we want to predict our label could be any kind of number, right? So any real value number, 
right? as opposed to something that's more like a discrete categories where you have two categories for a binary class or 10 or something like that. Right. So uh, this, this is a, there's a lot of examples where we're trying to predict house prices. We got a lot of different data sets. Your uh, assignment two is another a different data set of house prices that you're supposed to use. Uh, no, I take back that. Yeah, I changed it. Um, so the, your assignment two, we're going to be doing some stuff with some weather data. Uh, but but yeah, so for this uh, notebook, um, the simplest is um, so some terminology here. Um, so we load this data set, uh, which has, um, 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 yeah, I don't remember, but maybe, yeah, it, it actually has more than, than one feature, but uh, uh, we'll go back to the simplest idea. So we're, we're gonna extract two features from this data set uh, the price and the, the square foot, the, the size of the houses here, right? Um, so the, we're going to turn this into the simplest case, right? So if you look at this, um, um, so I guess maybe maybe this data set only really only has those two in there, right? So if you, if you look at the original data frame, uh, here's a description of the uh, value. So we've only got 47 uh, samples in this data set, um, you know, the square foot ranges from um, uh, a minimum of 852 square foot up to uh, 4,000 plus square foot, right? So that, that's going to be our, what's called the uh, independent variable. So what we're going to do is, is we want to try and make a model where we predict price and the price we're, we're uh, making the hypothesis that the price um, depends on the size of the house in square foot. So that's what dependent and independent means here, right? So independent is the square foot uh, and the price uh, we hypothesize depends on the house size. Uh, and further, since we're, we're creating a linear model, a linear regression, we're hypothesizing that it depends in a linear way. So there's a direct mapping that every, uh, unit of change in size of the house will have a corresponding uh, uh, linear change in the uh, price normally, okay? Um, so, you know, uh, what that means is something like this. So, uh, and you have to do something like this for the second assignment. Um, so uh, the most basic thing, uh, if you have a basic, regression problem like this, where you only have one feature, so one independent variable, uh, you want to try and predict the dependent variable is, uh, that's the only case where we can really visualize it. Um, you know, so we, we always, by convention, plot the independent variable, so the, the size and square feet goes on the x-axis, um, and we're going to be plotting uh, the y-axis as the dependent variable that we're going to try to make a model of. Um, um, you know, so build a model, uh, a linear model in this case, right? So uh, our particular data looks something like this um, in this case that we're doing for this example. And there's roughly, you know, there's it's, it's, it's you know, we can say a couple of things just by visualizing this. Uh, you know, we can say it does look like it's positively correlated. So the bigger the house size, the the, the more the price is, the the cost or the selling price, or whatever this price is. Um, I mean, you know, it might be roughly linear. I wish I could predict this. Um, uh, I mean, it does seem like it doesn't look like it's um, like we maybe need a nonlinear model as if there's some sort of a, a curve here on the two dimensional plot. Uh, th there might be a, a line that might make a good prediction model for this data if we fit it to this uh, data here. Um, Okay, so um, I think I, I started talking about this last time, uh, although I, we, we weren't discussing uh, fitting a line to points uh, in terms of applying that to how you uh, determine the best linear fit here, right? But, uh, but we talked a little bit about, you know, um, uh, one thing, Ellen, you know, I encourage you, you know, I'll remind you again about the, um, um, 
the uh, the review notebooks. I thought I had it in there, probably maybe on the previous week. Um, so it would be good if you haven't yet to review the uh, the one about calculus, where we go into um, some of the things about uh, a line and the slope and things like that, as well as derivatives and things, which will also be useful to understand the gradient descent, right? So, but the most basic, you know, um, you know, we talked about that, but like if we look at the first two points for this data set, you get these two points, right? Uh, and you should understand that, you know, we can always fit a line that exactly goes through those two points, right? Um, uh, if we just have two points. So in this case, you know, if we use the slope intercept form um, and if we have our two points, uh, we can figure out the, the the slope is just the difference. It's the ratio of how y changes to how x changes. And so so y changes from, sorry, I need to make this a little bit smaller, but um, so y changes from 330, you know, from 400 to 330. So y changes 70 uh, for an x change of 500, right? So we have a slope of 70 over 500 um, you know, approximately on this data here, um, which gives you, you know, if you calculate that ratio, you get a 0.13 something, 0.138 um, as our slope, right? Uh, and then the only other thing, so there's many lines, I, I, I think I talked about it, there's many lines that would have that same slope you have the line that goes exactly to those two points. You have the line at the same slope that, that, that's below that. And you have an infinite number of lines with that same slope, right? So to get the the, the one line that goes to those two points, um, you know, I, I can just, uh, I, you have to figure out the other parameter, the, the B parameter, which is called the intercept parameter here for the slope intercept form. Uh, so given M, I can just plug in one of those points, like, like the, the point zero uh, at index zero and, and get the intercept, right? Um, so, um, for a line, uh, you know, remember we've got one independent variable, one independent feature. So all you need is two parameters to, to uh, describe the line, uh, that, uh, um, fits, um, uh, one point or two points, uh, with a particular slope. Uh, so the intercept, uh, I don't know if we showed it here, but um, if we had um, replotted this line, you know, just to show what the intercept means, um, um, that's going to be the, the location where when x is zero, what, what the value of y is. So if I, um, um, if I run everything above this, And we plot this, but if we redo um, the axes, like uh, I'm have it go from like they say negative one hundred to um, where it currently is twenty two hundred. Um, uh, what is that function name? X range or something? Uh, or another way you can do it is you can specify both the uh, X and the Y. I'm blanking on the, uh, the the name for if you just want to specify the X axis range. But um, but yeah, if we want it to go from negative 100 to 2200, we can specify that. Uh, oh, and um, um, yeah, let me, you know, so if we extend that line, it should be hitting, uh, you know, zero at the intercept point, right? So, so when x is zero, um, um, uh, y should be the 107, right? Uh, but this is a good thing, you know, so uh, understand what we're doing when we plot lines here, right? So we, we have two points, uh, and I'm trying to fit, I'm trying to, to visualize the, the, the fitted line here, right? So this is kind of our model. 
uh, or what we're going to be calling our model here. Uh, so at this point, you know, if, if you want to visualize like a model, you should plot that as a line. Uh, in this case, when I did the plot, um, 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 my my x points. I have two. I only have two points in x points here. So this is a. Uh, um, or actually, there's 100 points, although I, I did kind of an overkill here. But you know, this line, the X points only go from 1, 1,500 to 2,200, which is why we have there. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I probably shouldn't have this. If I want to create a line on a graph, I really only need two points. So I, I could have just had the two points from 1,500 to 2,200, right? So this is going to create only two points, two X points, Um and then we will calculate the y points for those, but we should get the same line, right? So it'll look the same. But um, you know, if we'd done this, so you know, when you do it for your assignments, if I need the line to go from there, but all the way down to here, uh, I want my x. I want to pick two points on x to fit a line to from negative one hundred to two hundred, uh, and then use my slope intercept to calculate the the y points that correspond with those two X points, right? So that gives us here. And then, you know, um, if you went and looked at it, I started off on this tangent, but the, but that should be the intercept location. That's when X is zero, uh, Y is the 107. That's, that's why it's called intercept. Uh, in fact, when you look at the parameter, the parameters uh, for the linear regression from scikit-learn, it, it actually calls that intercept uh, when when you uh, when you ask for the that parameter um, from a fitted linear model. So. Um, all right. Anyway, but you know, so that's that's just a review of like fitting uh, longitude points. But um, um, let's say you have this though, right? So what does it mean? Um, if I've got three points, right? So if we take the first three points, um, and uh, I might want to go ahead and, and change this back so that I um, let's change my X points back to the same range I had before. Um, so this is where we begin talking about linear regression. So uh, if I have three points, what is the line uh, that's the best model of those three points, right? So now that I have three points, unless they happen to all be on the same line, uh, I can't have one line that goes through all three points, right? I, I could pick, maybe, maybe this is the best model that goes through these two points, right? Maybe the best model is the one that goes through those two points, right? I mean, you know, if, I, if I'm just picking two of the three points, I could end up with uh, a model that has a, a different, a negative slope instead of a positive slope by picking these two. Right. Um, intuitively, since you know that I'm trying to build a model that's going to predict the uh, dependent variable, uh, I want something um, that, that has positive slope, uh, but maybe maybe the best thing doesn't go through any of the points, in fact. Right? But, but something in here, we can draw in here, right? Um, so anyway, I mean, what's the line that best fits like those three points. Um, um, oh, yeah, I mean, if you take this line from fitting the first two points that we had before, if you plot it back on the original data, it, it's actually uh, uh, looks like it's not a bad line, right? So intuitively, you know, if I asked you, if you don't know how linear regression works, I ask you to fit a line to give you the best predictions um, of prices from the size of the house, you might draw something. I'd, I'd probably draw about that same slope, but maybe a little bit down here because it looks like the best lines might, uh, get better predictions if you go down here uh, a little bit. But, close to that, that slope there. But that was only, for one thing, that was only, you know, coincidence. It just happened that the two points that we picked before, uh, you know, again, we're plotting that same line. It's going through that point and that point there at, um, at like 1,600 and 2,200, right? But that, that was just, if I picked two other points, I'd get a very different line, right? So, um, 
Um, so to, yeah, to cut to the chase, um, um, uh, how do we, we need, we need to formalize this idea of what we mean by the best line, right? The best model for this data here. Right. So, so, you know, it, we can't just intuitively try and pick something. We have to have something, we have to have a definition of, of what we mean by how well something fits a set of data uh, so that we can compare two different models and see this one fits better or that one fits better. Um, so, um, before we figure out how to do that, uh, there are multiple ways that you can do a simple linear regression. To, to fit a line to a set of data. So polyfit um, is built into the basic NumPy. Um, so uh, 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 next week we'll learn why it's called polyfit. But the, in this case, the third parameter here, if you pass one, that means I want to fit a polynomial of degree one. So you end up fitting a line to the data. Right. So here, what we're saying is, and notice, so polyfit. When you say I want a degree one polynomial, well, I want to fit a line with data. It returns two parameters, um, and those are really correspond to what we we're talking about. Those are the slope and the intercept of the line that it fit to the data. There, right. So you know we don't know what its definition of best is, but it's claiming that the actual best line, the actual best model that fits this data has a slope of 0.13. Notice that's pretty close to that slope we were talking about. So 0.138 um, that we had uh, before here. But again, that was just kind of coincidence or by random. Uh, but PyFit is telling us, you know, we've got a slope about that same slope, although we have an intercept of 71. So it, like I was saying before, intu my intuition was kind of right. Uh, so a line pretty similar to that, but a little bit lower. So we, we need the intercept to be down around 70 instead of a little bit above 100. At least that's what PolyFit claims is the best model there, right? Um, right. Uh, make certain that you understand these examples. So the first thing you have to do for the uh, assignment that's due this week is do, you know, similar kinds of plots. Uh, first and second thing, you know, you have to visualize the data. And then after you fit a linear model, you have to uh, display the linear model uh, on the plot uh, of, of the uh, raw data points, right? So, uh, but yeah, you know, um, if we go back and look, um, um, so here again, you know, um, I should probably fix my example. If we're if, if you're plotting something that's not a line, you, you probably need more than two points. But uh, if you're plotting a line, you really only need two points. So if I, I should get exactly the same result, uh, if I just create uh, a set of two points uh, and plot my model. So here we're plotting both the original um, line, which was in M and B, and we're plotting the M best and the B best line. Um, so that's why we get the two lines uh, on here, or that's how we calculate the two lines to, to display on this one. Um, um, yeah, and there's lots of ways. So, you know, uh, the the um, uh, Seaborn has a function to calculate a linear regression and plot the line and plot uh, an indication of the uncertainty or the error for the fitted best line. Um, um, just an example of that. Um, all right, so to get even more formal, um, so this uh, notation is used in the textbook. Uh, if you're using uh, Dr. Ng's videos, he uses the same notation, right? So we can formalize um, a linear model um, as instead of slope and intercept, um, we'll just call those parameters theta zero and theta one. There's a reason why we do that, but but um, we're doing the same thing here. The theta one is what we were calling M or the slope before, uh, and theta zero is the uh, the intercept term. Right? So, so now we've got, we're just calling this our two parameters of the model, right? So again, what we're trying to do is we need to somehow figure out what are the correct values for those two parameters to have the best fitted model to the data there, right? Um, and this, so we often use y hat in this notation. Uh, let's just call that, most people just call that a hat. 
because that's going to be prediction, right? So that's different from an actual label. So we'll use Y. Uh, so so often we use just X and Y for the uh, for the independent variable, and Y is the label or the dependent variable. If we only have you know uh, a regression problem here. Uh, but then when we have a model, um, you know, we, we've got our slope and our intercept, it, it's going to make prediction. So um, what that means by that is think about this line here. If I asked it to predict what the house price should be for a house of, um, of um, 2,500, right? So the, an actual house of square feet 2,500 had a price of a bit over $400,000. But my prediction would be a little bit under that. Right, because all the predictions, the Y hat will be the uh, the blue line here if I need to make a predict with this best fitting linear model. Right. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you know, again, if you understand this notation, every, every prediction Y hat is going to be on the line defined by the slope and the intercept, the theta, theta zero and theta one um, in this notation. Um, So we use subscripts to label the parameters. Um, and for if we only have one um, uh, independent variable, we're only going to have two parameters, slope and the intercept. Um, and we use uh, subscripts to uh, label the features here. So here, we've only got one feature, one uh, independent variable, which is the size of the house in square feet. So we call that x1 in this formalization here. Um, and then other, so, you know, it's often, it's common to use N as the number of features. So remember we had 47, or sorry, uh, the number of features. Uh, so we only have one feature um, in this one, the, the size of the house. Uh, and we often use M for the number of samples. If you look at uh, people treating this stuff formally. So M was 47 for this data set. We actually have 47 um, um, houses uh, that we plotted in our scatter plot here. Um, So um, we use this notation because you can actually fit a linear model uh, even if I have more than one feature. So if I have like the house size and square feet um, and um, um, what are some of the other features that we have, like uh, say the number of bedrooms, uh, one, two, three, or something like that, right? I could have two features. So you can't really visualize it once you have more than uh, Two features. I mean, you could visualize two features on a three-dimensional figure, uh, but once you have three features, you can't really visualize it anymore. But you can still fit a, a linear model to it or a hyperplane if you have uh, more than one feature. Um, you extend the I, that basic idea. Right? So if I have two features, I would just have my intercept and I would have two slopes, two coefficients for the model. The, the slope for uh, for for the um, first dimension of the first feature and the slope in the second dimension of the second feature. I have three features, I'd have to have a third slope, right? So, so I have as many, th these are called coefficients uh, by um, scikit-learn. So I have as many coefficients as I have features, one for each feature, but I have one additional term, which you can think of it as that intercept term. Right? So when I have only one feature, I actually have two parameters that I have to fit the intercept and the slope. And when I have more features, I have more of those, right? Uh, <coughs> um, we'll come back to this, but um, 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 you the one reason why we formalize it like this is we can turn this into linear algebra, basically. So instead of thinking of that as a polynomial um, with uh, multiple features, um, we can think of that as a vector um, so in this case, you know, so if I have uh, if I have n features, I would have uh, n plus one um, parameters, n plus one theta from zero to n. Um, and um, what's not shown here is that um, uh, you can think of um, also having uh, n plus one features, right? But but we'll we'll introduce a dummy feature called x zero. Uh, so that's something that you need for this assignment too for this week is is uh, 
the stacks model doesn't handle the the dummy feature um, for the the um, intercept term, right? But if you just add in uh, an x zero that's all ones, um, this will work here. So this notation is equivalent to that. So so doing the dot product of theta, where you think of theta as having zero to n theta values and X is having uh, zero to N uh, X uh, features. The dot product of that is multiplying each one and summing them together. And that's your linear model, all right? So that's, that's equivalent. Uh, and we'll come back, but, but yeah, by turning this into linear algebra, we can do things with NumPy um, um, and other things uh, more powerfully, all right? But that's that's what we're doing here. But but you should familiarize yourself, become comfortable with this notation here. What we're doing. Uh, but that means that um, you know I could do something like um, um, instead of training it as a bunch of terms in a polynomial, um, I can, for example, create a NumPy array. Let's say with the, um, the slope and the intercept. Um, um, so we have the intercept is at uh, index zero of what I called theta, and the slope is at index one for my model, for the best fitting line that, that Polyfit said was, was our best model here. Um, and given that, um, you know, we can calculate our hypotheses. Uh, well, um, so what we would be doing like here is, um, you know, we have our original uh, feature called X, uh, so if I want to do my calculations, I have to add have to add in uh, uh, an additional column, column zero, uh, a dummy column of all one. Right. So this is the original square feet that I had that I fit the model to, uh, but now I've got uh, an additional second column at column zero of all ones. And again, we do that or stats model. You have to do that for stats model uh, when you do for your assignment too. Uh, so we can do this, right? Um, um, so I can calculate the hypothesis uh, in a vectorized way using NumPy uh, by taking the dot product of my theta parameters um, and my um, x. And I have to transfer. Sometimes you have to transpose or manipulate these a little bit. But but yeah, the data product of that. The result is forty-seven predictions in y hat. Uh, but that should be the prediction that my best fit model gives um, for. Uh, a house with 2,104 square feet, uh, and that's the prediction for a house with 1,600 square feet and so on, right? So each one of these corresponds to the predicted value for each one of these um, house sizes that we had in the original X, okay? But yeah, be able to turn this into a linear algebra problem means that we can perform vectorized calculations, which means that we can uh, run optimization techniques um, in using efficient libraries uh, like NumPy uses, libblast, and um, um, all those other things. Right? Um, I don't. Don't know if this is important right now, but like I said, there's there's different ways you can rearrange this to do the calculation. So instead of doing the transpose, you can just do the dot product in the other way, um, get the same result, um, I believe, and even get the same size array, I believe. Uh, but but yeah, that's we'll come, that's not too important right now. You'll need to understand that better though as we go on, especially when we start talking about gradient descent um, and looking at how you implement gradient descent. Um, um, okay, so uh, back to linear regression. Um, so we can use those two theta values. And again, remember what we've got at this point in the example is the theta is what Polyfit claimed was the best fitting model, right? So, you know, again, if I run those through here, I get my Y hat, which is my, uh, my predictions or my hypothesis is another thing that these are called, right? And we can plot those, right? So again, remember, these are the predictions for all of the original data points. So for every one of these actual Ys, 
my actual real labels, I should have a corresponding prediction, right? It's a little, little tough to see here, but you can see every, so, so this um, yellow X was my predicted value for a house of size approximately 3,900 square foot, right? And this is my predicted value for this house of 4,200 or so. Right? Um, and, and again, you know, so these are just my predictions or my hypotheses, I don't have a model that's going to make perfect predictions. Um, but um, given the information I have, um, we're claiming that this is the best predictions I can make using a linear model, right? Um, and um, I'm not certain if it's mentioned here, but you know, you should you should also realize that if I want to predict uh, the price for a house that I didn't have originally, that wasn't in my original data that I fit my model with, I can do that too. So you know, my my prediction for a house of 3,500 square foot um, would be right there. You know, um, a little over 500 thousand um, dollars uh, in, in price. So I don't have to predict just the, the values that I had that I fit my model with. I can use this to make predictions for any house size. Right? Um, but um, um, but here, yeah, so we were showing, though, you know, making our predictions with our original data that we fit our model with. So that brings us back. So we can talk about why is that the best model? Why did PolyFit? claim that that was the best line for this data here, right? So to, to, to do that, we have to formalize what we mean by best. And that's what a cost function or a fitness function is. So in this context, uh, we, we're going to define a function that um, we can use to determine which whether one line is a better fit than a, 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 some other line, right? So to do that, we have to, to define what we mean by better. Um, 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 and we have to, you know, be able to, um, we have to, you know, be able to uh, um, defend our choice that this means that this line is a better line than another model, another fitted line, right? So, you know, to do that intuitively, you know, you should understand that, uh, uh, how far off my prediction is from the true value is, is some indication of how well I did predicting that one particular data point, right? So uh, given my model here, you know, I had some that I predicted almost exactly, like right here and here, the things that were right in line. Some I didn't do very well on at all, right? So I've got uh, one house here, a little under 1,500 square feet that, that went for, almost $500,000, where in this model, um, you know, we would predict that it's um, uh, much less, under 300000 or so, right? Um, but, you know, that's the, the first step, is that um, um, the how far, how, the, the difference, the magnitude between your prediction uh, and the actual value is going to be part of our answer of, of how well this model is fitting. Right. So it's easy to calculate that for any individual point, um, which is what we're showing here. So if I want to calculate the error, so we usually call these the errors or the residuals. Um, so for one point, I can always ask, OK, how far off was my um, prediction from the actual value? Right. So in, in this point in the notebook, we've got our predictions in the Y hats. We have the actual values in Y. So just the difference of those is going to give the magnitude. Right, so for this value here, uh, we had a difference of 45,000. Um, now, but how well I do for one uh, isn't a, a very good indication of how my model is doing overall. I really need to have uh, some idea of how it's doing for all the points I'm gonna make predictions for, right? Because, you know, I'm doing well, if I just look at one point, I, I'm, I'm doing perfectly here, I'm doing awful here, relatively, right? So the idea is that uh, um, my cost function, I should sum up all of those errors, right? So the, the naive idea is, uh, let's just calculate the error for every one of the single points that I'm fitting my model to, the residuals, and sum those up. 
Right. That, that would give us an idea, right? So, I mean, if every um, prediction uh, was was perfect, you know, so if every one of these actual labels fell on the line, I'd have zero error, right? It would be a perfect fit. Um, but, um, you know, some of these, like, like the, we were taking the difference between, what did we do? We took the difference of the prediction minus the actual. Right, so we took the prediction minus the actual. So for this one, the prediction is lower than the actual, so you get a negative number, right? But uh, other cases, the prediction here minus the actual prediction is bigger, so you'd get a positive number. So depending on whether it's below or above, the difference of the residual would be negative or positive. Um, and because of the way that this um, uh, we fit a linear model to it, actually the sum of these residuals is going to be zero, which you'll understand later on why. But if we sum these up like we do here, um, so that that this is uh, again, you know, we're just showing using NumPy vectorized operations, so we can calculate each individual residual all at once. Take y hat minus the label, so predictions minus labels is the errors or the residuals. Um, so, and we take the sum of these errors. So this is the sum of the errors, sum of the residuals. Um, and um, uh, for a linear regression, those should always be pretty much a zero. Well, it's not quite zero, but it's to the negative 12. It's effectively zero to the precision of, of our floating point numbers on our computer here, right? Very small. That'll always happen for a linear regression model using the cost function that we're building up to here. The, the sum of the residuals should be zero effectively. Um, but um, 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 how to say the, the um, so you should, you should easily see though that that I can have another line whose error should be zero, another set of data whose error should be zero. So if, if I had another set of 47 data points, but all of them were exactly on the line, it would also have a sum of the errors of zero, right? But it's obvious that that, that set of data, the line is fitting perfectly, whereas for this set of data, it's not perfect, right? So I can't just simply take the sum, because uh, that's not giving me an indication of overall of how um, well we're fitting, right? I would get a zero sum for this data, but I also get a zero sum for another set of data where all the points were exactly on that line. So I can't just sum up the, the errors uh, be, because basically they cancel out. Some of them are negative, some are positive. So I need to sum up the, the, the magnitude of the errors. Um, so the, the first idea that most people, you know, when we lead you down thinking about this is just use the absolute value, right? And that is you. That's, that's called the sum of the... Uh, of the mean error, the mean uh, absolute error. So if you ever see me, MAE, mean absolute error, um, or the sum of the mean absolute error, um, you're basically doing that. Right? Um, so in that case, you know, the, the sum of the absolute values of the errors would be zero for that hypothetical perfect fitting set of data that I had, but it's it's not, it's not zero here, right? So we get 2,444. Although this does mean something because, you know, uh, since we're taking the absolute value, this is the average. So, so we're taking the, the um, 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 oh, sorry, no, we're, um, we're not averaging yet. So we're just taking the sum of our um, overall of all of these here. Um, so um, it's common to want to ask, okay, how much are, am I in on error on average? Right, so so normally we'll take like the mean, uh, we'll take the absolute error and take the average of it. So that's the mean absolute error. I jumped ahead a little bit there, right? So so if you take the absolute, if you if you divide by m, that would be the mean. So this this means something. This means that on average, my predictions are off by fifty two thousand um, dollars for this fitted model. Right. You know, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, but the average is fifty-two thousand um, dollars. 
So um, we're doing pretty much the, the same the, the same idea, uh, but instead of using the absolute error, uh, we usually use the the squares of the values, uh, and you'll understand better why uh, later on. Uh, mathematically, this helps for optimization to use the squares instead of the absolute value. Um, but yeah, instead of taking the absolute value, if I just squared the errors and then did the sum and take the average, we get what's known as the mean square error, or the, the, the sum of the mean square errors. Uh, so you'll see that term a lot for linear regression. That, that's the actual cost function that we use uh, normally. Um, and you know, so don't let notation scare you. So uh, everything we just did, this is the a formal way of, of um, defining the, the mean squared error, right? So we're taking the sum of, so inside here, notice what we've done is we've used the, the uh, linear algebra notation. So this represents the y hat. So thetas times the x's um, is like our y hat. You know, although we're, we're doing this over all of our M samples. So um, 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 anyway, um, so, so that's gonna be our predicted value or the residual. We subtract that from the actual label for each uh, sample item. We square those. Um, I, I guess I skipped it over, but you know, right. Uh, the, if you square a value, of course, if it's negative, it becomes positive, right? So. Um, so again, we're getting some measure of, of the magnitude of our error when we square it. Um, although it will be bigger than the absolute value, usually, if our values are more than one in error here. But when anyway, we square those, we sum them up, right? So, so all we're doing is this is summation over all of our M samples, and then we divide by M. So that gives us the mean of the sum of the, of the errors, right? the sum of the squared errors. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that formal notation, um, um, there's a little description of that. I mean, you can translate that into, you know, so here, um, uh, this is the, since we're, we're explicitly iterating over samples one by one, when we're at zero, that means what, that we want the, the sample at uh, index zero of our data here. Um, and this is going to be the, the zeroth label or whatever uh, label here. So we're using uh, the exponent to, uh, it's not really an exponent in this notation. Um, it, it's really indexing into the nth, the ith sample of m that we have here. Um, so, but to cut to the chase, you know, it, Try not to let things like this scare you or, or try, you know, you should be capable of understanding translating this to the corresponding NumPy Python code here at this point in this class here, right? So what that means, if I want to calculate the, the, the mean of the sum squared errors, uh, it's pretty much the same as like we did before, but um, um, so we calculate the errors, it's just the difference, but we square them. Um, so here, but we're not, doing it over a loop, we're using a vectorized way. Um, so um, this will square all the errors individually, but then this will sum them up, right? That's, that's the same as performing this sum here. And then we can divide by M to get the mean. So the average of the sum squared errors, right? Um, and again, this will this is the actual measure that we're gonna be using for our cost function for linear regression, the, 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 the mean of the sum squared errors. It's a little bit different from the, the mean of the absolute error. So notice that we get 4116 um, uh, for the sum here. Um, so, it, oh, and, and yeah, if we want to convert this back to a value that's kind of meaningful in the same um, units that we had before, we should take the square root. So we have to take the average, we take the square root. Uh, we're saying that on average, um, our uh, sum of the squared errors is about 64,000 a lot, right? So it's a little bit different from the absolute error, but but it, it means the same kind of thing. Um, that's our average of the uh, square root of our squared errors uh, that we had here, right? But you, you, yeah, you can think of that as um, um, 
once you take the square root, uh, that gives you a feeling for, on average, how far your predictions are off uh, for the model that you fit. Um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip over it. Um, uh, we, I probably won't talk about computational about the normal equation here. There's because we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, optimizing this using gradient descent. Um, but um, um, you can actually optimize optimize. You can figure out uh, the, the the just real quickly here. This is a way to figure out the best fitting set of theta parameters using an exact method instead of using um, a, um, a method like gradient descent. Uh, we might come back and talk about that later, but uh, not today. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you run this, um, you should find that uh, uh, that um, you get exactly the same set, uh, the, the same uh, intercept and slope as the polyfit gives you. But uh, but here we were uh, calculating that using this uh, normal equation. So, um, all right. And uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go on here. So I wanna also talk a little bit about, so we're not completely done yet with, um, um, uh, with the with the steps here, so uh, the argument is is that the 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 sum of the the, the sum of the squared errors, the mean of the sum of the squared errors, represents a, a good way to determine uh, whether a particular line fits well or not, right? But so so we have a method. We could, if I just randomly pick two lines. Um, I can calculate the, the the mean of the sum of the square root of the errors, um, and um, um, whichever one has a smaller uh, average sum squared error uh, is a better fit according to that uh, definition that that fitness function, right? Uh, but that still doesn't tell us, you know. So there's an infinite number of lines that I could fit here. Um, so if I can go back to um, um, real quickly, back to like a, um, a figure here, you know, there's there's an infinite number of lines I could fit to a set of data points like this, right? So how do I find the one that has the, the we need to find the one that has the smallest of the average of the sum squared errors. Right, that's that's what we're doing here, right? And that's what the normal equation does in an exact way. Uh, but what we'll, what we normally use um, is um, 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 an alternative method, um, a, a generic optimization method called gradient descent. So uh, this method will allow us to figure out what is the best parameters uh, that will give us the the minimal. It basically is minimizing that sum of the squared errors uh, cost function that we just defined, right? Um, so it's really helpful to uh, build up an intuition of how this works here. Um, so um, let's say that we have four points on a line. Um, so here we've got a line with just a slope of one. So point at zero, zero, one, one, two, two, and three, three, right? Um, and, you know, so let's calculate the, the basically what was happening in the notebook here, the, the second one for um, um, chapter four um, is let's see what happens if we have different lines, what, how that affects the, the calculated cost that we just defined here, the, the average of the square of the errors, right? Um, So here, I mean, you know, we, we can create a separate function to calculate the cost like we just described. Um, so given 
a hypothesis. So here, theta is going to be like our hypotheses, hypothesis that we talked about. Um, although we've simplified things here. So, you know, in order to make this real easy to visualize, uh, we're always going to use um, um, a slope of one. So we're only going to be checking lines uh, with a slope with the same slope, but maybe above or below, right? And you calculate the cost here. Okay. So, so to do that, all we have to do is, is check different intercepts, right? So this one has an intercept of zero. The, the one with the, the, the line that actually goes through these four points is going to have a cost of zero. It has a slope of one and an intercept of zero, right? So, so um, uh, uh, M is one and uh, B is zero uh, in this case. That should have a cost of zero, right? But any other line with a slope of one, but that's not exact, that will have a different cost. It should be bigger. Um, and that's all, that's all we're doing on this example here. Um, so, um, um, so this works in a vectorized way. Oh, um, you know, so you should, if you look at this, um, what we do here, uh, we're calculating the cost the same way that we showed before. So given a theta, we, we calculate the Y hat or the predictions. As we call here, using uh, using a, 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 a dot product. Actually, we're doing a matrix multiplication now. Um, we'll show why later on. Um, and then, you know, the errors is really just the difference between our y hat or the predictions and the labels. That's another thing we pass in is the correct labels. Um, and then we uh, square those, um, sum them up, divide by m to get the uh, root mean squared error. Um, Right. Here, the only you know the only thing that's different is we can pass in different um, um, intercepts as one of the parameters for the data that we want to fit. Um, but we're always going to be passing in these same four points uh, for the data that we're fitting a model to. Right. So you know if you calculate um, um, for a, do I have that backwards? So uh, I guess we're passing in the slope instead of the intercept. So we, we always assume that the intercept is zero. Uh, so if you pass in, you ask for the, the cost with a slope of one, you'll get zero here. Uh, so that's what happened here. Um, if you ask for uh, the, the cost for a line that intercepts, um, um, uh, that, that has a, a slope of 1.1, um, with the same intercept. So I, gu I guess I did have that backwards. So we're actually not using parallel lines. We're using lines that go through the same intercept but have slopes that get bigger or smaller. Right? So they're all going to be going through that point. But like a, a 1.1 slope would, would go and, and uh, be a little bit above there, but would go through the same intercept. So that, that that's what was calculated here, right? Um, or something with a slightly smaller slope. Um, but notice that, you know, Neither of these are perfect fit, so they have a bigger than zero cost. Um, some things you should realize from this. So the way that we define the error, you can't have an error less than zero, right? Since we're squaring the residuals, we're squaring the, the error terms, all the errors that we're summing up are going to be bigger than zero. So once you take that and take the square root or take the uh, average, um, you have to have a value that's zero or bigger, right? Um, um, oh, and, you know, the, the way this function works, though, you know, it was specifically built so that you can actually ask for uh, more than one hypothesized model at a time and get back the cost for all those, right? So here we're asking for uh, seven different models with slopes from negative one to three, right? So we'll pass those in. So we wanna calculate the cost for seven different models here, right? So these are the different costs. So for uh, a line with a negative one slope, so, you know, this is a line with one slope. So one with negative one slope is gonna uh, go you know, exactly uh, at a 45 degree, but in the other direction, right? Um, um, so, right, with negative one slope, you get 14 cost, uh, up to with a, a slope of three, we get also a 14 cost, right? Um, 
So we can plot those. Now, now this is um, an example of, we're plotting um, our different models here. So we've only got one parameter that we're varying, uh, the slope, uh, but um, we're, we're plotting the cost for each one of those, right? So, you know, as we already know, if we have a slope of one, they all have the same intercept, but with the slope of one, we have a cost of zero. And any, anything that's not a perfect fit for that is gonna have a bigger cost up to, um, up to negative one to three, both had um, costs of 14, this model here, right? Um, and we don't have to evaluate just those seven points, right? So we can make it smoother. And so this will also help with your assignment, right? So instead of evaluating those seven slopes, we evaluate a hundred slopes, but within the same range from negative one to three, right? So you can see that uh, it's not really um, um, a discrete kind of thing. It's, it's actually a parabola, right? So, so the, 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 the function of varying the slope to the, the cost that will happen will be a smoothly varying function. Uh, and because this would make sense, again, if you understand some of the stuff like uh, about how uh, derivatives work and things like that, the, the, the cost function, we're taking uh, a square of the result, right? So the, the cost function is gonna be a parabola because whenever you you uh, plot a, a function that's a, a, a power of two polynomial, a square function, it's gonna be some sort of parabola like this, right? Um, and that's what's happening here, basically. Um, 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 this, this will always happen when you use the sum of the square errors cost function. Uh, it, you won't, you, you, there won't always be a parameter or set of parameters that end up with zero cost, but there will be only one exact point where the cost is at the lowest, right? So you'll always end up with, uh, technically this is called a, a con, con, uh, concave function, or do I have that backward? Convex? I might, might say it in here. So you always end up with, with a cost function with the same uh, shape, uh, which means that there will be exactly one set of parameters uh, that will give you the smallest cost possible to fit that line. Right? The only difference is, is that uh, for a real model, we don't have one parameter. We're going to have many. So you can't really visualize this. If I, if I have if I have two parameters, I could visualize it on a 3D plot. Uh, and in fact, you know, that that's attempted to be shown like uh, here. Um, by the way, if you're using the uh, environment, if you turn on using uh, matplotlib widgets, uh, you should be able to um, uh, rotate these figures that are done in here um, if you've got the right um, um, extensions installed. So that's the Jupyter Lab uh, and the Jupyter Matplotlib and the Jupyter Widget one. But uh, but yeah, in two dimensions, if you have theta zero and theta one, it's still a parabola, although uh, because of the way we did it here, it's, it's a bit sharper. Uh, but a, a thing to realize about this figure is it looks like there's sharp points, but it's really smooth. That's just a limitation of how I discretize, how we had to discretize this in order to plot this in a reasonable amount of time. But it really makes a bowl. Um, but the bowl, um, like if you look at it from the top, um, is kind of wide this way and, and narrow this way. But it does come down to there's one exact um, global minimum um, for this line that we plot here later on in this uh, notebook. Um, So, right, it, it, um, um, we had gotten to this point. So all we're showing at this point is that um, instead of just varying that one parameter, the, uh, the slope, if you, wanna, if you wanna find the global minimum where you both wanna find the slope and the intercept, so theta zero and theta one, I would have to have two parameters. So there's another version of the cost function here where we're expecting a theta that has uh, uh, the slope and the intercept, but we can do the same thing. I think the code pretty much doesn't change, almost doesn't change. Um, so we can calculate the residuals, um, and um, uh, which gives us our predictions. Uh, we can calculate the predictions, and then from that, get the errors of the residuals, do the square of those um, to, um, um, to get the root mean, root mean squared error here. 
Um, and that's what we're doing. But, you know, uh, since we've got two parameters, theta zero and theta one, these should correspond to theta zero should always be the um, intercept term. So that should, uh, oh, no, I guess I have that backwards. So that's, no, that's right. So this should be the intercept term. That should be the slope term um, for theta zero and theta one. So, um, So I have to remember here. Oh, uh, but yeah, uh, the reason why I'm drawing, I, um, I should go back and fix this. I, I change, if this doesn't make sense, we change the the we change the line that we're trying to fit a bit. I should I shouldn't have done I shouldn't have changed that because I know it always confuses me. Um, but but yeah, now we've got a line uh, going through point zero one one two two three uh, instead of zero zero one one two two. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the minimum ends up being at. Uh, theta of, of one, theta zero of one, and a theta one of one. Um, um, this is a minute over here. Um, okay, um, and um, so I spent some time on that. Um, so um, we can finally, uh, uh, we got five more minutes left here or so. Uh, we can find, if you understood all that, you can understand what gradient descent does, okay? Because again, it would be helpful at this point to understand what we mean by taking the derivative. Uh, so that's equivalent to what we're talking about by the gradient here. Uh, but um, um, you know, back to this one here, uh, where we only had one parameter. If I just pick a random parameter of theta one, uh, let's say I picked ra randomly theta one as negative one, right? I can calculate what the cost is, but I can also calculate the slope of the gradient at that point. Um, and the, 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 the slope at that point is going to be negative. It's going to be a pretty big negative number, right? So by, by calculating the gradient, I, I, I can just pick my parameter or my parameters at random. But if I pack, calculate the gradient, that tells me that I need to make the, the value theta one in this case bigger in order to reduce the gradient. So I have to go in that direction, uh, um, add to it, right? So then, uh, so if gradient descent is a um, iterative method, so I might choose a step size of, of 0.1, right? So if I choose negative one at random um, and the gradient was negative, that means I have to add 0.1. So I would calculate the gradient at negative 0.9. Right. Now I'd still, I, I would see it was still negative, so I'd go no, another step. So you, you would just keep doing that. That that would follow the gradient down until we get down to the close to the minimum. Right. So from any random point, the claim is because this function is concave and there's one global minimum, I can start anywhere at random, but I can follow the gradients in small steps until I get close to or down close enough to the 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 point where the cost doesn't change anymore, which will be the global minimum, minimum for my, my cost function, right? Um, and that's what we were trying to illustrate here. So, you know, again, if, if we pick theta zero and theta one at random, so uh, this is back to the data, the house data that we started with originally. But if I pick theta zero and theta one at kind of at random, so initially, um, Theta, theta zero, we, we picked as uh, um, 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 an intercept of above 1500 with a slope of minus something, right? Uh, then we calculate the gradient. So that corresponds to this line here of with a negative slope and an intercept of 1500, right? If we calculate the gradient here, um, so we've got two dimensions now, but um, um, the, it would lead us to reduce the um, um, uh, the theta zero parameter and also to, uh, well, to increase the theta one parameter. But, but if, you, if you keep doing small steps uh, and plotting the resulting lines, it looks something like this. Um, and it, it'll zero in down to the... Um, uh, the global minimum, which we all have already calculated with polyfit here, right? So the, the final result down at the bottom here is the one with the intercept of 70 
uh, and the slope of 0.13 or whatever it was um, for this data set. Um, but, or 0.18 or something. So the slope is about 0.18 uh, and the intercept is uh, the, like the 70 something down there. Um, All right, and so you know, make sure you know this is important. Uh, make sure that, that you kind of understand what's going on here. If 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 some things have gone by fast for you, one final thing here is that you know gradient descent. There's some caveats to using it, uh, but it is the standard optimization method that we use. So if we can define a cost function for some machine learning method uh, that is, is concave, or even if it isn't, but as long as it it, it uh, you can has some minimum points. We can use an optimization method. Um, uh, normally in this class, we will use gradient descent. So it works um, that you can just start with a random value for all your parameters, calculate the gradient and follow that. Um, you know. So some of the caveats are though, is that if your step size is too small, it might take you forever to, to get down to the global minimum. So, so you might be converging too slowly. Or at the other end, if you make your uh, step too big, right? So if I calculate my gradient, I need to go, I need to make theta one bigger. If my step size is like 10, I would go from negative one to negative nine, then my cost would actually be bigger. I'd, I'd be over here and somewhere where it's bigger. And so if your step size is too big, you would diverge. You'd, you'd start jumping away from the minimum instead of converging down the minimum. That, that's usually pretty easy to detect if you have a well-formed function like this, that's concave, but for a more complex function, you can't tell if you're diverging or um, if it's just um, that your landscape has more than one minimum or something like that. So, um, Okay, uh, yeah, so that, uh, you know, if, if you follow that, th this will be helpful for the current assignment because you do have to do a couple of things with uh, like, you know, this is why we have to have that dummy parameter for stats model. It doesn't add that into you by hand. You know, it doesn't add that for you. Um, um, yeah, and, and a couple of other things, you know, about plotting and stuff, you have to do similar things for the assignment too, so. Um, all right, so yeah, we've we've kind of come up to the time. I'll let you guys go. I didn't specifically look at the questions. Thursday, we'll spend more time. I'll, I'll bring up the assignment. Uh, I can stick around. I, as usual, I've got office hours or I can stick around a bit. So if, if you have been working on the assignment too, if you want to ask some questions, um, um, come and see me if you can. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. I'll let you guys go. See you guys on Thursday then.